Welcome to this week's Swarf and Chips. This is what's coming up on today's show. Now, this week's show is all about manufacturers. I don't know if you remember, but a couple of weeks ago, we asked manufacturers based in the Midlands who have recently invested in a new machine and automation to get in touch. So guess what? They did. So we packed our cameras, went out to see them, and this is what we got up to. Yes, you're not wrong, Lindsay. A very exciting show lined up today. Yeah, it's all about uh, investment in machinery. We're visiting subcontract engineers, uh, precision manufacturers. We go to Unilathe, uh, we're at Rotec, we're also at SPE. But what a place to start. The show is very much geared around investment in technology, automation, uh, robotics and industry for this week. And as we are here at Fanuc in Coventry at their new place in Anstey Park, this is a great place uh, to start the show. Geo's inside talking to Paul Richards about Fanex Robot Solutions. Paul, we're going to look at a few automated solutions um, that you offer at Fanex, and we're mm -hmm. going to start with the standalone robots. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about these robots and what kind of industries you place these robots into? Yeah, yeah sure. These are really starting with the R1000 robot is probably what we term as a medium payload robot. There's a, there's a low payload and there's a higher payload. The R1000 falls into the sort of medium payload category. It's ideal really for machine tending applications, for handling, uh, sometimes palletizing, various applications where products need to be, to, to be handled up to around about a 100 kilo payload. And do you get involved with a lot of bespoke turnkey projects with these robots? Nearly everything is a, is a bespoke turnkey project. You start with a blank piece of paper most times and see how the robot fits in and which robot you need to select from the range suitable for the application, the payload, the reach and the environment. This is a standard automated solution from Fanuc. Now, um, can you tell me a little bit about this configuration, please? Yes, what we have here is a Roba drill. Uh, CNC machine being loaded by a FANUC robot and integrated into the robo loader which is uh, a FANUC product also. So from this solution you've got a one-stop shop of a robot, a CNC control, CNC machine and also the integration of the, of the two together all done by one supplier. Can you tell me the importance of having everything from FANUC? Does this simplify the interfacing of the machine and the robot? It does simplify the interface, yes. It means that you, with the software that we have, we can control the CNC through the robot or the robot through the CNC. It depends on your preference of the operator, whether they're knowledgeable about robot programming or CNC programming. And it means it's a one-stop shop as well. It's interfaced to one machine here behind you, uh, Paul. Now, can this quite easily be interfaced to a second machine? Very easily. You can see here that there's a machine by the side of the robo loader. If that was pulled over and there was an automatic door on there, then your one robot system could be loading both machines. So you could have OP10 on one machine and OP20 on another, or you could have one part on one machine and one part on another. It's a real mix and match. But the great thing about that is it divides the cost of your automation by two. And it's quite a small footprint. It is a small footprint, yeah, which is one of the benefits of the robo drill machines. They're a very small footprint, and, and this sort of goes along with the, 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 the same philosophy. Uh, you know, floor space is expensive. So medium volume, high volume work, great solution. Now let's go and have a look at the collaborative uh, robot for the uh, lower volume work. Why would I look to buy a collaborative robot? Really, a collaborative robot is designed to be able to work next to a human, uh, to do operations that are difficult for a, a robot to do, either because it's very difficult to do or not justifiable, but there's an element that is repetitive that a robot can do very easily. Now, is this safe? It is safe, yes. If you touch the robot, it'll stop. Uh, it works at a safe working speed. It's to the latest safety standards, high safety standards that are on the market for a collaborative robot. And how easy is this robot to program? It's very easy. Uh, there's, there's two ways of programming it. You can either program it in standard FANUC teach pendant language or with a new robot control we have called the 30IB+. You can program it, program it with IHMI, which is an intuitive system, and it will get you up and running out of the box within 20 minutes. That's quite fast. Now, the solutions we've looked at today are not the only solutions that FANUC offer. What other solutions do you offer? We also offer uh, things like force sensing, uh, robot vision, 
uh, which is Fanuc's own solution. Everything that we, that we sell generally is manufactured by Fanuc in-house. Uh, with vision, it means that the vision system can be able to give some intelligence to the robot to be able to find parts on a conveyor, identify them, maybe inspect them, all sorts of applications for picking and placing, machine loading, all sorts of applications. And do you see a significant growth in automation over the last few years? Very much so, particularly just lately, yeah, everybody seems to be wanting to see uh, what automation will cost, investigate the application and whether it's suitable for automation. Uh, skilled, uh, oh, sorry, unskilled labour is, is, seems to be getting harder to come by as well. And is it, uh, can it be incorporated with Industry 4? I know this has been a big topic and we've been out on the road um, over the last week um, looking at some new technologies. Is this something that can be integrated? Uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, Industry 4 uh, capability to a fan of control is nothing really particularly new. It's just now got a bit of a name, but yes, we can connect it to the Internet of Things and, and you know, it's open to your imagination. Gio, good chat with Paul there. Did you end up buying a robot? I didn't buy one, Paul, but um, the technology in there is fabulous. OK, so we're going to now move on. Uh, we're going to Unilever in Stoke. Here's a company that hasn't necessarily bought a robot, but they've just purchased a new Kitamura machine. Uh, amongst other machinery over the last two years, a company that really believes that investment is the key. So let's go. Andrew, you're featuring on Swarf and Chips this week. Um, myself and Gio are here. We've, we've had a look around this machine. I, I tell you what, you, this is uh, really something else, isn't it? You differ a lot from most engineering companies, don't you? Yeah, definitely. I think um, you know we set out on a course some years back to, uh, I guess, cover a, cover a full-size range, uh, both turning and machining centre. Uh, and I guess a dis differentiator in that is also along with the size, so really, Yes, bar feeding and turning from 10 mil diameter right the way up to some of the larger machines that you can see where we can where we can handle three meter cubes, two and a half meter diameter, six meters in length. And are you busy at the moment? Yeah, I think as everybody, we've had a couple of couple of years where it's been a pretty tough climate. Uh, certainly, the last quarter of 17 uh, shown some real signs of, uh, of progress and growth. Um, we started this year as 18, really encouraging and, and some good signs, and we're picking up some, some really good orders with, it, with, with a good prospect for the rest of the year. Where's the good business for you? Because, I mean, I look around here, certainly the, the kind of rail industry rolling stock stuff, that, is, that, is that one of your big areas? Yeah, definitely. So traditionally, I guess, we, we try and split ourselves with market sectors. So we've got the off-highway, we've got rail, uh, some aerospace, and the oil and gas. Clearly, the oil and gas industry is still, you know, fairly at a, at a fairly low ebb. Uh, but I think certainly some of the industrial sectors off highway, rail, you know, really encouraging growth prospects there and demand increasing on a month by month basis at this moment in time. What about your skill set, your, your workforce? You, you've got a lot of guys here, haven't you? Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, testament to the, to the guys we have got and the skilled guys that we've got. We're really trying to encourage bringing some of the younger guys through, uh, really taking some real invested heavily in training through last year with the frontline leadership team that's enabling us to to really focus on the strategy of bringing other labor through uh, and along with the offline support along with tooling offline programming and engineering support i think that's beginning to pay dividends now in a strategy that's uh, that, that's really beginning to work for us and it's not just investment in people i mean the, the machinery mark was telling me earlier uh, since the last time we were here four or five years ago i asked him what machines he'd purchased or procured yeah. since then we were talking for about half an hour. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's continuous, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I, th I think we've always been fairly aggressive with our approach in terms of machine tool investment. Uh, and I guess through you go through the economic cycles and, and that's really dependent on what demand's looking like. I think we see now that we're coming into that, certainly that a bit more exciting times in terms of demand with the sectors that we're supplying into. And that enables us to two things, really. One, one uh, reinvest in some of the equipment that's a bit old and, and, and a bit old hat, uh, whilst also bringing on some exciting opportunities that give us opportunities with some new machine tool technology and really take advantage of them things. I've got to ask you this question, because I was, uh, uh, was a machinist, I did an apprenticeship, sure. uh, and a, a, lot, a lot of the machining I did um, often was on low value components, and there was always a fear about scrapping parts and making mistakes. Some of the, some of the components you got here, I mean, these guys, that, they must worry a lot about making a mistake, do they? Yeah. How often does it happen? <laughs> I think hopefully not too often, but I think it's down to culture. You know, I think our track record around quality 
you know, I have to say, is, is fairly superior and it's second to none. Uh, yes, we do get issues and we do get times where you've got where you've got problems. But I think again, testament to the management team, the awareness, the support we put around that, you know, making the guys on the machine tools actually feel like they can get on with the job uh, and they're supported if there are any issues or, or there are errors that creep along. Uh, we're all human by the same token. It's about investing in the processes as well to ensure that that's not going to happen as, as frequently. And I guess, you know, from a, from a tooling point of view and, and the way the strategy that we fixture up, tool up um, and look at supporting componentries and manufacture, I think that, that sort of sets that quality, quality level from the start. You said that things have picked up over the last quarter or you've been exceptionally busy. Going forward this year, you expect that to continue? Yeah, I think the numbers we've seen, I think it's encouraging for the first time in, like I say, 18 months, a couple of years now, where, you know, we're starting to talk about schedules, not just for one month, two months in advance, but certainly now, you know, certainly first half of the year. But I think the reality is for the rest of 18, looks very buoyant. There's some of the old industries, oil and gas, that, you know, we've seen some resurgence there and coming back up to a, up to an acceptable level where demand's starting to, uh, to increase. Uh, and hopefully we are well set to, uh, to take advantage of that. And do you sub work out here, Andrew? We don't. It's not been something that we've, uh, that we've traditionally done. Uh, we've, we've, over the last 12 months, we've got a couple of smaller uh, local shops that, that we partner up with. Um, I guess our culture has been a case of we want to do it all and we're a bit greedy that way, which is fine. Uh, but I think along the way, both with the customers and our supply chain, I think there's an element now where you've got to start collaborating more with both sides to ensure that, that the supply chain's met. And I think we, we see ourselves as an important piece of that supply chain. Uh, so we have to engage with our suppliers and maybe subcontractors as we go along uh, as much as we do with the customers. Good stuff. Well, I'm going to go with you and have a look around the, the whole of your works. Thanks okay, for your time sure. today, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks very much. We've had an amazing visit here this morning at Unilave. We've been shown around all of this massive facility. What, what do you think of this facility and, and what have you uh, found out today? I, I think the biggest thing is when you come, when most of the engineering companies we come to are dealing in maybe smaller term parts or prismatic parts. It's pretty rare you go into a company where there's such sizable components for such a varied uh, industry sort of set. I mean, some of the rail parts have seen here today, the rolling stock parts, incredible. Uh, and also some of the parts for, well, just for, for, for all types of industries. Some components that are going through machining times of sort of 80, 90 hours. I mean, it's incredible. What is interesting, Paul, is the name of the company is Unilave. Prior to my visit, I, w I, I would have assumed it's all turning, but that's not the case, is it? It's, uh, no, it's, a, it's, a, well, it's turning, it's boring, it's milling, um, it's, it's everything. And I wouldn't say that they're, they're stronger at one than the other. You'll go around one corner and you'll see they've got big um, SFM and XYZ uh, long bed um, sort of oil country lathes. And then you'll, then you'll go into the other shop and they've got an Integrex Mazak and a WFL machine that's mill turning. And then here your horizontal machining centres. So, you know, they can pretty much tackle anything and it is very, very good. To, it's very good to be in. Bill, thanks for your time today. I see that you've invested heavily in Mazak. Um, why, what is the reasons for this? Well, we put our first Mazak machine about two years ago, um, an i500 Variaxis, which is a tremendous machine. It allowed us to get into a really good uh, project for an aerospace customer. So we broadened on there. We followed up with um, two VTC 800s, a uh, couple of lathes, uh, and now we see the machines behind us, two VCN 530s. And what's the reason for the VTC 530s? And what? And this is also, you've also diversified into other industries as well. Yeah, we are. we've also got a growth plan for the company. So we're looking at different market opportunities. 
uh, and we had an opportunity to manufacture some automotive die castings. So we've set it up uh, in its own manufacturing cell um, and you can see it behind us. And on this journey, how do you find Mazak have supported you and the service? Mazak's service and support has been excellent. We've been really impressed with it. Um, at Emo this year, um, Industry 4 was, was the subject really and there was a big em emphasis on Industry 4. Yeah. You're, you're one of the first companies that, well, that I've visited anyway that is looking to embrace in that technology and again you're looking to go with iSmart technology? Right. Yeah, we, we've invested in the Mazak iSmart system. Um, we have a, a good culture here, uh, we're obviously um, looking at different measures as KPIs every month and one of the most important ones for us is OE, overall equipment effectiveness. Uh, to measure that properly at the moment is quite onerous. We have to fill in quite a few timesheets. Obviously, the guys who work here help us collect that information. So it's all about having good, live, uh, comprehensive information, which will allow us to make good decisions in the future. I suppose the software effectively is making the old system foolproof, collecting that data um, when it's done manually. You're not getting accurate results? No, we trust that it's accurate. Um, and I think we're nearly there, but to have the ability to have instant access to live information, that's the most important thing for us. And it's not only on the Mazaks that you can collect data, it's on other machines as well? Yeah, we're going to link up to all our productive CNC machines. And um, We'd like to come back once it's all up and running and to find out how successful it's making you and to see what productivity and efficiency gains uh, you're, you're getting effective. Yeah, we'd love to have you back. Um, we'll, we'll be installing the system shortly and we're all looking forward to the results. Thank you, Phil. So there we have it, some interesting comments there from Phil. What's your take on the business year? We've moved a few miles up the road here to SPE. Uh, what do you think after talking to Phil? I think it's excellent that, um, and it's brilliant to see uh, a company really investing in the latest technology um, and, and the positive effects that this is having on the company. There's certainly no uh, downturn here at SPE Precision. Phil was saying earlier how much the company has grown hence the recent purchases of the Mazak machines, but the business goes far beyond milling as well. Uh, a sliding head shot, uh, really are at the top of their game here in Stoke. Uh, Gio, one thing I've got to give to you today as well is Phil's uh, given me this quite kindly. Nice little World Cup here. Now, for those that don't know or won't have recognised, well, I'm sure you have, uh, Gio actually has a little bit of Italian in him. So I'm going to give him this because Italy won't be uh, fortunate enough to be at the World Cup this year. Uh, but you never know, England might be. So what do you think of that? Um, hopefully England will win the World Cup this year. <laughs> so that's it, we're going to move on now to our next destination. So our road trip around the Midlands this week continues. Today we're at Rotec Engineering uh, and with Paul and Ellie here from the company. General Manager Ellie is and Paul's the Managing Director. Uh, Paul, I'll, I'll come to you first. You've got a lot of uh, high levels of technology and automation here. Is this something that the company's recently embraced? Um, not really, you know, embracing technology has always been synonymous with Rotec's uh, vision for the future, uh, which is basically a fully automated machine shop, from, you know, with lessons we've learned from the small star machines, which want to use that on the larger machines. Um, and I think um, where we found ourselves to uh, have a competitive edge is by using technology in the right way, and sometimes a combination of different technologies together, Creating a, creating a scenario where we can actually produce things in a way other people can't produce them. And I take that point is very much to do with the, the wholesome uh, robots from hi and the integration with the machine tools. Ellie, have you been involved in that as an installation? Uh, yeah, I was involved in the installation process, but also through the quoting process of these jobs. So obviously if I could see a job that I'd, I'd ideally put on a sliding head machine or one of the turning lathes, if we can find a way that we can put it on with the robotics and, and when it lights out now, then obviously we come up with that scenario. But it's not all about the cycle time, is it, on those machines? You're not looking at the parts and thinking, well, we're going to make it now 10 seconds faster. You're actually looking at the reliability, the, the whole process of, of yeah, taking the man away and keeping the machine running. Yeah, I mean, it's all about the utilisation now. So if we can get more, man, uh, more hours out of uh, the parts we're producing instead of chasing the cycle times, then that's the way forward for us. And I mentioned to you earlier, Paul, about Industry 4. Uh, and you were quite unsure about what the, the term actually meant, but when we dug into the detail, you've been embracing that sort of um, level of software and integration for years, haven't you? you? You measure your KPIs, you measure how effective the machines are. You're pretty good at that too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, no, we've got years with the data. It was really useful to it, because while, while, uh, while kind of one week's data is not really of any value on its own, and when you look at it in context of the, of the 
data that we've measured in the same way for years and years and years. It's really good actually because it gives us that small, it just gives us that, 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 that fine data that we can actually manipulate as we change things, we can actually see the effect on the business. And obviously with a business like this, uh, you know, uh, if we can make a, you know, a 5% difference in our utilisation, that's actually a huge impact on the bottom line of the business. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. And if you do that on every machine, that, that makes you a much more efficient, effective and profitable company. Ellie, um, females in engineering, how, how long have you been working for the company and where did it start for you? So I've worked for Rotec for 12 years now, since 16 as a, an office apprentice. So I went to production supervisor, production manager, operations supervisor, operations manager, general manager. And, and here we are today. So. so now as general manager, what does your role entail here? So um, get together with the team and we look at the production, the jobs we've got coming on. With the sales team, we go through the quotations and obviously always looking for the extra bit of work in different ways for the capacity, the utilisation of the machinery. Good fun. When it comes to your staff, Paul, are they the most important thing in your business? I think so, absolutely. The synergy between the staff and the machine tools and the technology is, is, is what it's all about. It's, it's, you, can't have, you, know, you can't have the skills and the staff without the technology, you can't have the technology without the skills and the staff. Um, all the time here we're looking to try and improve what we have and how, the way we do things. It keeps people motivated. You know, we've obviously got an ongoing regime of training and improving people's skills so they, so they become from operators to actually maybe learn how to use the program and the robots, etc. So it's not about replacing people, it's about, with technology, it's about embracing technology and moving people forward with their careers. And you're, you're, you're a very successful company. I'll ask you both the same question. I'll start with you, Ellie. What, what do you think the secret to the company's success is here at Rotec? I think, really, it's uh, having a great leader, putting everything on the line and, and you know, always wanting to go... Well, did you pay her to say that? <laughs> always wanting to go forward all the time with new innovative products. And you had a few seconds to think about it, and you knew I was going to come to you. What would you say, Paul? Um, I think it's the, it's the fact that we've got very much a team approach to what we do. We, uh, we do embrace technology. We're not scared to take a risk. You know, again, with these robots, we're the first people in the UK to do this in the way that we're doing it. Um, and I think our customers see that as being quite innovative, and they want to be a part of that. You know, a lot of companies come to us because they can see where we're willing to, to look at things in a slightly different way, from a slightly different angle. And sometimes that could just be, mean you know, saving a few pence off the price of a part could mean a difference between them keeping their order and not keeping their order. Um, and that could be everything to our customer. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. And obviously quality, delivery, all those things are now expected in the, uh, in the industry. Well, it certainly shows very successful business. I said you're in the Midlands, but you're, you're sort of South Midlands, aren't you? I know we've done a lot of miles this week. Yeah, we are technically in the middle and still, apparently, with our postcode, yeah. I mean, uh, we're right on the southern side of it, but uh, we like this part of the world. It's quite, it's quite you know, pretty part of the world. And, um, we, you know, we, we, we did think about moving a few years ago amongst it all a bit more in Birmingham, but I'm kind of glad we stayed here, really, to be honest. Don't blame you. OK, we're going to have a look around the factory. Thanks for your time today, guys. OK, so we're going to have a quick look around. We're going to try not to get in the way of anybody because that's uh, we don't want to inter interrupt production in any way. Uh, the first thing I'm going to look at here, we spoke with Paul about automation and the halter machines that they've actually, uh, the halter robots that they've installed on some of their machine tools. Uh, here is one of them. It's loading this DMU 50 uh, five axis machine here and the machine just continually runs on prismatic parts here. It, it runs over the weekend. Uh, equally does this Nakamura AS200 uh, on the cylindrical components. This one's just about to be reset for another job, but again, you can see another halter robot there. Uh, over here, we have some mill turn technology, Nakamura Tome MT RX300, described by Paul as uh, the best machine that he has actually in his machine shop. This is mill turn technology. Uh, they don't have a bottom turret on this machine, which was quite interesting because some of their other machines do, but they wanted to get away from that. They wanted to simplify their manufacturing, although they are still making parts in one hit. As we move our way up the machine shop here, uh, we'll see another, uh, we'll see a, a Belia machine, a Doosan machine. We've got DMG, uh, a Decal or DMG, the Eco Mill there, 1100 to, the, uh, to my left there. If you just see that machine, three axis machining center with fourth axis units. Interestingly here as well, we've got two Chiron machines, high speed machining centers. I was looking at this machine earlier, equipped with Microlock work holding. Uh, it's not actually moving at the moment, I think it's set in the front, but the key to these machines is obviously the machine to be machining in the back end while you're setting the front end. It's all about productivity on repeat components. As we work our way this way, they've got another Nakamura 3-axis uh, three three machine, 
and then we start moving into sliding head lays again this was the cat well this was the catalyst of the foundation of the business these sliding head lathes from star Paul initially started his business with Cam Autos uh, two decades ago and obviously needed to move into CNC to remain competitive, uh, to compete with overseas work. And now he has nine of these sliding head lathes. He does describe Star as, uh, for him, it's the best sliding head lathe on the market. Superior technology, high speed, uh, high speed machining on turn components. Uh, and that's been a very quick uh, tour around here. Now this is a 30,000 square foot facility, recently moved here. He's going places, Paul is, so you need to keep an eye on this company. If you're looking to subcontract some work out, whatever industry you're in, these are guys that you could be talking to. This is Aerotech Engineering. Cycle Time Challenge. Guys, or oh, and Lindsay, a bit of an unusual cycle time challenge this week. We're at BTEC Engineering in Bracknell. They've got a really fantastic machine shop. DMG, Morris, full five axis simultaneous, Herco machines, great big envelopes. But also part of the equation is their CMM room. Now, you can see here they've got the Mitotoyo CMM. This is a manual one, but they've recently bought a new toy, which is a full CNC CMM. Now, it's this machine just here. Really, really impressive. Measuring an aerospace component. Now, as you can see, first point of call, they've got the engineer's essential there, the plasticine, which you see absolutely everywhere, but they used to measure this manually. It would take almost a day to measure. How long do you think it's taking now with this new Mitotoya CMM? Wow, what a show. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And if you want to watch any previous episodes, click on the links here. You can get involved still in the Cycle Time Challenge by putting your guesses in the comments box below. And as we always say, keep those spindles turning.